because it's in Manchester and it's sunny and it's full of uh, not just blokes so all of those things that I love in one place so uh, and I would I mean you know like everybody said I would just echo a massive thank you to the team who've made this happen which is just so exciting to have it on our doorstep so uh, okay so I'm going to talk about uh, that that horrible word success and hopefully just take the opportunity to kind of challenge the norm and uh, what society for the last 30, 40 years has been telling us uh, success looks like. Okay, so um, if you don't know anything about me or what I do for a day job, then uh, I'm the founder of a digital studio in Manchester called Magnetic North. We're based just up the road. Um, the clues in the name were north, you know, we were proud from the beginning. We were not in London. Or somebody did once ask me if we were North London, but we're not North London. <laughs> we're actually in the north. Uh, and so um, we started the company in 2000. Before that, um, my background was working in big traditional multinational communications agencies, uh, which I joined in search of the kind of creativity and hedonism and excitement that I'd kind of read about that it turned out just died in the 70s and uh, and so it was a bit like joining a big uh, accountancy firm by the time I got into the industry which uh, was a great grounding experience but largely creatively a bit disappointing and then and then the internet happened uh, in the kind of late 90s because I am that old and uh, and that seemed really exciting and like all of the things that I'd read about when telly arrived in the ad industry there was this new thing to play with and it broke all the rules and it changed everything and uh, rightly or wrongly I thought it was going to uh, change the world and save us and so I, so I left uh, my very stable well-paid job to go and start Magnetic North uh, and we started out um, like everybody was at that point we were a web design company, that's what everybody titled. And then some people called themselves interactive design, which was a little bit cleverer than web design. But, and there were about three of us in Manchester. Uh, one disappeared in the dot-com crash, so there were two of us. Uh, and then what we've seen over time, which you know, for anybody who's kind of been around it long enough, is, is the path that everybody's seen, which is you know, the move into what became interface design and uh, Everybody who was in the industry at that point had to make a choice whether they were going to become a digital marketing company or they were going to do interface. We chose the bit where people meet machines, which became experience design and became UX and UI and service and all the, all the things that we kind of do now. So, and in that time, we've been really, really lucky. We've worked with some amazing people, both within our own organization and within clients. We've worked for some incredible clients. We drew a, a list and stuck it on the wall of all the people we want to work with, from the BBC to Diesel to Google to uh, Urban Splash to all these people that we just thought would be really interesting to kind of work with and learn from. And we've done all of that. Uh, uh, but we started out with a very particular ambition and kind of ideology. We probably wouldn't have used those grown-up words at that point. It was just kind of what we wanted to do and, and where we wanted to spend our energy. And, and we always put the emphasis on the work and what we were going to make and the output and could we somehow make enough money in that to pay our wages and keep keep ourselves alive and keep a roof above our heads and and it's interesting as the kind of industry's grown up we we've never really changed the, that perspective and and those values but but what's interesting is the amount of stick you get particularly as a female founder for for making those decisions so you know, quite often, you know, I've been called a hippie, which is quite, quite ridiculous. I've got the hair, but that, that's about where it ends. Or the, the super patronizing one you get is, oh, so it's a lifestyle business. Pe people love that one because if you're a woman and you have a business, then it can only be, you know, to buy shoes with the money that you make, you know. So, so, so it's really interesting that, that we've kind of, we've always wrestled with this notion of, of, of what success looks like. And as the industry's grown up, you know, most of our, peers now have sold to someone else and, we, and we've made that conscious decision not to do that. So the so next year we are 20 years old, which I can't quite believe, but we are. And it's a really, really long time, you know. So I always say like internet years are a bit like dog years, you know, and you know, it, it's in one year this crazy stuff happens. People invent some stuff or, you know, we discover Cambridge Analytica or we, you know, all this stuff happens and it's really condensed. And 
you know, just, just as in life, um, we've always found those kind of markers and those anniversaries are a great time to stop and pause and think about your life and who you want to be and where you're going and where you're heading. And so we, about a couple of years ago, we, we with one eye on, on this date next year, decided to do just that. And we kind of stopped and paused for a bit, uh, which is hard because we're not a startup, so you have to keep running the business and really began to ask ourselves what it was we wanted to do for the next five years. So by the time we get to 2025, what is it we want to look like and feel like and, and do? Um, and so really that's about success. You know, what does success look like for us if we stand there in 2025 and, and you know, decide how we want the world to be? So, so it's really different. I mean, when we started 20 years ago, less than 25% of the UK population had internet access. You know, I, I left my job and somebody kind of patted me on the head and said, well, when it all goes tits up, you can kind of come back for your real job. You know, there was no view that this was going to change the whole world. Um, and the world has moved on enormously. Our practice as designers has moved on enormously. And, you know, we're certainly not one of two studios in Manchester anymore. So, so we started this process by looking at two things. We um, did what we would do for a client that asked us to do this and we commissioned some research and we got an independent researcher to go and talk to all the people we'd work with and tell us, um, which is brutal by the way if you ever do it, uh, what we're good at and what we're not good at because we knew that that would help us to inform where we needed to focus. And then the other thing we did was we started to look at the world around us and really think about, you know, we don't operate in a bubble, it does feel a bit like that in our industry sometimes, but you know, we operate in the wider world and everybody who works with us is a person and they operate in the real world and they buy things in the real world and they live in the real world. So in that wider context, where on earth do we fit in the bigger picture? So I think the, the, the big conclusion I have at the moment is there's an awful lot of stuff that's very broken. Uh, and, and I think there's a real sense of being in a moment in time, globally and as a society, and, and that actually a lot of the stuff we thought 20 years ago was going to work out quite well just hasn't. And therefore things are going to have to change. So uh, I have to start with the B words. So, you know, the delightful Boris, the even more delightful Brexit, you know. Uh, but what's really interesting, you know, is like, so how did we get there? What happened? You know, what happened in the last five to ten years to create a situation that we have, you know? So, uh, the price of the current definition of success is this, you know, it's the benefit of a very few individuals at the expense of everybody else. You know, the rise of debt, the rise of fear and anger, a generation of people wanting return to the good old days, and whatever we think of that, politically or the moment we're in or the, you know, that tells us that, that it's not worked out very well for an awful lot of people and that generally we're not really in a very happy place. And then there's that other thing, you know, which today, today of all days, we're going to see literally writ large on the street, you know, uh, all of that against this even more important backdrop of, of a concern about what we've done to the planet. You know, this heightened sense of urgency, which, which is, you know, is, is the right heightened sense of urgency, that we've got to sort this out. And, you know, guess what? Like, that's all the consequence of the stuff we've been striving for, of what we've considered success to look like, which is we need to own more stuff, we need to travel more and see more of the world, you know, and so much so we've become so obsessed with the things that are perhaps not the things that are making us happy, that we've kind of broken the planet along the way. I'm not single-handedly blaming him, by the way, but you know, he's had a part in it. So I think when you start to think about that, what's really interesting is this kind of very 80s view of success kind of still lingers on in a lot of places, certainly in, in corporate life. You know, so the kind of poster child of the 80s, you know, and all of the kind of entrepreneurs that you associate with, with people like Branson, you know, this real kind of Thatcherite focus on personal wealth, personal wealth sometimes at any cost. And, and we don't really seem, even though we've made all these technical advances and, and, you know, the world has moved on massively since the 80s, 
actually how we define success largely in our corporations and within our society has not actually evolved very much. So the idea that company success is still based pretty much on scaling, you know, in the tech industry, you know, scale it, scale it, scale it, scale it, we've got to scale it, 100x. Uh, and squeezing, you know, how do you squeeze more value? How do you create more profitability, more margin, more productivity? And we still talk in that language and that construct a lot. Uh, and that's what we get proud of. You know, it's what we celebrate with awards. It's what we put people on stages to do. It's what we give people medals for. You know, it's that they created all this wealth. Uh, and then what's happened is those kind of children of the 80s have grown up. They've become our role models. They've become the policy makers. They've gone into government. They've become the advisors. They've become the future investors. And so if you um, have to sit in those torturous investment processes, what you see is largely people who've made this kind of wealth looking for other people who look a bit like them to invest in them and make more mini versions of them. So we're stuck in this slightly torturous <laughs> cycle. So in, in company terms, this manifests itself in this, this absolute dogged obsession with shareholder value. And uh, most corporate business is kind of constructed in some form around this idea of creating wealth for those people who own the organization and the corporation, okay? And again, that's often at any expense. Nobody's asking really until a bit around the edges how Uber really makes its money and what the quality of life for the drivers is and the guys in the Amazon warehouse and you know all the stuff that's now beginning to rumble around the tech industry. Um, and there might be a bit of a nod to it. We make a charitable donation or we have a CSR program or we do some work in the community or we built that garden. But largely the construct is still about the people at the top. So a really good friend of mine, um, a chap called Jason Stockwood, who if you haven't read his book, read his book, talks about this. And actually we, we who've grown up in this universe, you know, in, our, in my case, children of the 70s, probably 80s and 90s in the audience, uh, we think that the world's always been that way, but it hasn't, you know, and actually it, it's, it's a construct of the 1970s, really, where uh, an economist called Milton Friedman, you know, began to write and influence and suggest that actually, as he called it, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And before that, really, business wasn't defined in that way. You know, that wasn't the view of all boards. It wasn't the view of all corporate organizations. And then at a country level, you know, we magnify that. We make it even worse. We talk about GDP, GMP, the same principles about how we measure success, but we celebrate it at a countrywide level. So I'm really interested I don't know if anybody caught Jo Swinson's speech at the Lib Dem conference this week, but um, she talked about this and she talked about happiness and you could see the same kind of hippie sniggering around uh, why would anybody talk about happiness? But she had this amazing quote, which I hadn't heard before from Bobby Kennedy, which um, I'll read, I'll, in I'll indulge you with a, uh, a quote if you don't mind. And so he said, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, or our compassion, or our devotion to our country. It measures short, except that which makes life worthwhile. I'm, I'm with Bobby, okay, I think Bobby got it right. So I, I always kind of talk about this as like, you know, and, and it, I have the, uh, the sad reality of having to deal with a lot of people like this in my world, but this is like this, my big fat car is bigger than your big fat car syndrome, you know? And so this obsession that is like, oh, look at me, I'm successful because I got this bigger car and his car's this big, so he's not as successful as me. And it's just, it's antiquated, it's entirely ego driven, it's pretty selfish as a perspective. And frankly, it's kind of got us into a bit of a pickle, hasn't it? So if we think it's bad in the world at large, as we all know, try working in the tech industry. So like this kind of frat party, 100X bro culture, you know, that uh, it's amplified. I mean, it's unreal, you know, uh, all the things that Lizzie talked about at the beginning, you know, we feel it in the culture in that way. And it's been so dominated 
by such a very narrow demographic. You know, I remember Kirsty talking about this at something in her tech nation days, you know, and uh, saying, isn't it interesting that actually the products that Silicon Valley's ended up creating are the things that 25-year-old blokes need, like somebody to cook for them, somebody to drive them somewhere, somebody to, you know, and actually we've been skewed towards um, the perspective. Uh, and it's so investor dominated. So by the very nature of it, you know, at the point your WeWork and you're raising, you know, more money than Facebook needed to raise to, you know, to progress, then, then you know, you're talking about money all the time. All that matters in that is, is the money. And so I think that combined with, frankly, the promise of some of those tech companies, you know, I, and, I, and I 20 years ago wanted to be part of that industry. I still do, just a, bit, a different bit of it. Uh, you know, these were the corporations that were going to save us, right? You know, these were the big tech companies that were going to take the evil corporates down. They were going to give the traditional companies a run for the money. And it turns out they're even more disappointing in the main than any of the people that we thought were evil 20 years ago. So, it does get more optimistic, I promise. There are, there are, we do turn a corner. So it reminds me, I have, I have little kids, I have a, a seven-year-old and 11-year-old, and I was watching a few months ago, as I was starting to prep for this talk, the Lorax. And it reminds me of that. And it's quite sad, you know? We've ended up in this place where our own greed has kind of spoiled everything. Uh, and, and what's really interesting, and, and this is where, where the hope begins, is that a lot of those people who kind of created some of this mess, and obviously I, I spend a disproportionate amount of time in the tech industry, but they've come through this, they've been the investors, they've been the commissioners, they've been the CEOs, and they've now got children. And what you see is they don't want their children to use the technology that they made. They don't want them to have an iPad. They don't want them on Instagram. They're hugely worried about their data. And so, rightly or wrongly, what's now happening is the seed of a desire to do it a bit better for the next 20 years, and actually for their children to make the world a bit of a better place. So I think this is our perfect opportunity now to start to redefine success and what it really means and how we really think about it. And you know, I, I think there is the beginning of this momentum and we've got an opportunity to kind of create a different definition. And so I don't mean this, like this, this you see a lot. So people are starting to cotton onto this and then, so what they do is they hire some really expensive consultants from London. And, uh, and they pay them a million pounds and they go, we need purpose, right? Come and give us purpose. And so they write this beautiful slide deck and they go and do all these stakeholder interviews and then they come back and go, here is your purpose. And the purpose becomes like a wrapper around the same old shit. And it's like, yeah, that's not gonna work. That's not changing the product. That's just changing the marketing. And nobody believes that. And the reason they're doing that is because they're realizing there's a whole generation of people who are coming through who largely don't want to work anymore for organizations who are doing evil things or have no real purpose other than making money. And so it's not about branding, it's not about a CSR program or you know, running a charity ball or any of the things that, that people um, have done in the past to appease their conscience and let them sleep at night. It's about real change in the core of your organization and hardwiring it into your culture. And that's not easy really isn't easy, but it is possible. So instead of Branson, Wilson, Tony Wilson. Um, so when we were starting out, our heroes were not any of those organizations. They were the people like the factory lot, Peter Saville and Tony, and you know, and even people like Ian Anderson over in Sheffield doing Design to Republic, who from the north of England were changing the world and changing the perceptions of their cities, not with a logo, but with the output, you know, and with the things that they made that changed people's perception and gave people a reason to turn up in a place and go to university here or fall in love here or whatever they did. And so I think this whole definition of success is fundamentally at odds with the creative industries and the design industry. And as somebody who, you know, I spent my whole career in some guys working in the creative industry and with creative people, and I don't think anybody I know got into this industry because they really wanted to just make loads of money. You know, the good people are here because they want to make great work and make great products and design things better and make the world a better place. 
So the idea that this should be our success measure is just fundamentally at odds with the culture I think we need to create. Um, so what's interesting about the Wilsons of this world is, you know, they did change the city, and yet I still sit in, in meetings, even with people who, you know, they're running the city, and the city wouldn't be the city it is without some of these people. And yet, because they didn't die rich, well, they weren't really a success, were they? We shouldn't really listen to what they had to say. So I think, I think we have to fight this, and it's right that it comes from the creative industry, actually, but that becomes harder the more people aren't indies like, like we are, the more they're swallowed into the big corporate machine. And if you're part of a big machine, then you've got to deliver return. If you've just sold your company, if you want to get your cash out, you've got to deliver the money you promised you were going to make them. You know, So it, it's not impossible, but I think its rightful home actually is in our industry. So I, I, think, I think Bobby Kennedy had it spot on. I think you know this idea of happiness is the answer. And when we kind of unpicked our company and in a process to pull it back together, we spent an awful lot of time looking at the science of happiness and there's tons of it and it's really interesting and it's well documented and, and it's validated and it's not hippie-ish. And, and it all consistently comes to the same thing, which is this kind of triangle of happiness and there, and there are three corners to this triangle of happiness. The first is mastery so this idea of mastering your craft or progress or whatever you want people moving forward and getting better every day at what they do the the second corner is autonomy and autonomy is about giving people the opportunity to make decisions do things make mistakes get things wrong and learn along the way and then the third corner is whatever you call it but camaraderie getting on with some of the people not necessarily everybody in the whole company but you've got a gang of people you get on with and and you love what you do so we're putting that, and it's not a utopia. I mean, some of, some of our guys are here today, they will tell you it's not a utopia. So I'm not, I'm not saying we've created a utopia, but in our definition and our, our push for the business for the next five years, that's what we're going to put at the heart of it. And that ultimately, those will be the things that shape how um, we think of success. Uh, so I think the good news is we're not alone. There's a growing number of organizations of varying scales and individuals and entrepreneurs and investors who are starting to kind of champion this, this idea of enoughness. You know? and so this question of like how much is enough? If you have one car or you have one house or you've got a roof above your head or you know, you've managed to feed your kids or you, you, know, you can buy a new dress every month or whatever your definition is, like surely there's a limit beyond which like that's enough and do you need the five ten percent more do you need uh the cost to society and to the team that work with you of, of getting that it's really interesting in terms of as a benchmark for mainstream i don't know whether anybody saw there was a piece in the ft in the middle of the week written by the editor a double page spread talking about um it, this has to stop, that we need to start to think about profit with purpose, that surely this is broken. So, you know, if, if the FT is starting to think about it, then there really is hope that maybe in the mainstream corporate universe, there's an opportunity to kind of champion this perspective. You know, I would also argue as well as it being our industry, I think it's quite Northern. You know, I think we're a little bit less orientated. We've not been the richest city in the country for a long time. Uh, and I think we have a different perspective. I think if you look at the city strategies across our regions, they are about fairness and equality and, and sharing economic growth, not just three guys at the top. Okay, so how do we get there? So I think this bit's the bit that should be really familiar to us all because it's fundamentally about user-centered design. And so uh, it starts by understanding ourselves and our definition of happiness and what we would like out of life and what we think society needs and redesigning the definition of success around those values it's about almost kind of rewiring the thing and the narrative about uh, to give us a much more modern definition of success something that works for the now so i'm going to finish with this and i think back to the lorax and a lovely quote but you know, I think it's also about, and women are particularly crap at this, by the way, uh, giving yourself the permission for it to be entirely personal. And if success to you looks like four days a week and seeing your kids and being able to put them to bed at night, that's cool, that's success. It's not a lifestyle business, 
it's success. And if success looks to you like giving 500 people a job because you want to grow that and you want to look after them, then that's success too. So it's an entirely personal definition, I, I believe. But ultimately, you know, the, the thing is as practitioners, as people in the design industry, what the science also tells us is if we can get to a place where we are happy, guess what? We also produce much better work. You know, fundamentally, our brains are happier, our teams and our cultures are happier. Therefore, guess what? We produce better output. And I think, you know, more, more importantly, even than that, we've got an opportunity then to have an even more positive impact on the world with the things that we put out there and the things that we create. Thank you.